Okay, folks. So we're going to get started 30 seconds earlier. Hope that's not bother for you. So we're going to get started today with Robbie. Robbie currently works for ARM. Some of you may know him. Uh, he's leading a team of performance and solutions engineers to support ARM's partners within the infrastructure market segment with a focus on cloud and edge native computing, data center networking, offload acceleration, hyperscale computing, and carrier 5G technologies. They help their partners provide and promote high performance, low power cloud to edge solutions built on the ARM Neoverse platform. Prior to ARM, he was a VP of engineering at Vapor AIO. Uh, oh, yeah, provider of <laughs> edge data center solutions. <laughs> Held multiple executive roles across engineering and customer success at Canonical. Uh, creators of Ubuntu Linux. Morier, please. No, oh, Morier? OK. And he started his 20 plus year career at technology at IBM, working and leading teams within their Linux Technology Center. Um, this session is going to cover two topics the ways ARM currently uses Ubuntu for workloads and solutions testing, development, and performance analysis with our partners in the infrastructure segment, and what additional ways we can collaborate with the Ubuntu server community to improve support for ARM solutions in the areas of real time Linux multi-architectural application support, solutions enablement, and benchmarking with Juju, and any other topics you would like to discuss. So if you have any ideas in mind, it's probably a good idea to note them down and chat them with Robbie later on. So the stage is yours. Welcome, Robbie. Test, test, test. Thank you, thank you. Um, so. That was a long intro because I submitted this just for a normal infrastructure track talk. And then I realized when I saw the schedule, it was a little bit bigger. So sorry for the long intro. It was really supposed to be like a conversational session. Um, yeah. So like they said, I used to, I work at ARM. Before ARM, I used to work at a company called Vapor.io where we did, it's a weird name, by the way, but they did edge computing, edge computing services. I ran their software engineering team. Before that, I spent approximately 10 years at Canonical doing many things of Ubuntu, many UDSs, many events. Um, so this is very familiar to me. Um, and then before that, I did Linux for IBM uh, for another 10 years. I've been doing open source for a while. I may look young, I'm 46. Uh, <laughs> or I don't, it's all good. It's not gonna hurt my feelings. Um, so, the agenda is going to be an introduction kind of, of what we do, what I do at ARM, uh, what we do with um, just my role there. It's a, it's a mouthful, but um, as I describe it, it'll make sense in a, in a way. Um, kind of the journey of Ubuntu and ARM. I've been part of it since the very beginning in Canonical for the most part. A little, I, I think I joined maybe a, uh, maybe a year after, but um, I'll kind of cover that. And then I'm going to go to going forward, which are just some things that uh, we're collaborating on now uh, with, with Ubuntu, using Ubuntu, some asks. Uh, and um, if I have time, Q&A, but you can just find me. I kind of stick out at these events as usual. Um, for those who may remember, I used to wear, I wore a Hulk costume at a UDS event many, many, many years ago. Someone showed me the video just yesterday. That's amazing. Um, you can Google it, just UDS Hulk, I think. You may see me dancing in a whole costume. Anyway, it's, it's Orlando UDS. Um, so let's get into the introduction really quickly um, about what we do, what my team does at ARM. So ARM, we're around 6,000 people. Uh, we have a, a large amount of software engineers internally. You may or may not know. Hundreds and hundreds of open source engineers across you know, multiple continents. We have in another you know, software group that does uh, tooling for ARM. Um, and then when the way that we're divided uh, within ARM from a business perspective, we have lines of business, right? We have client, which is mobile phones, laptops, um, any type of small device in terms of a, a user device. Um, IoT, pretty self-explanatory. Auto, again, should be self-explanatory. And then infrastructure. Um, infrastructure doesn't mean I work for IT, <laughs> um, though I get a lot of solicitations on LinkedIn for that. Um, infrastructure basically means the market, the segment. So think server cloud, data center networking, storage. 
Um, so all these lines of business work together with our engineering to put together collections of IP, intellectual property that we sell and license to hundreds and hundreds of companies around the world, right? Um, you, 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 everyone in here has ARM IP in their pocket. If you have a f mobile phone on your wrist, uh, in your TV, maybe in your laptop, I'm not gonna say that, that vendor. Um, but um, yeah, so what we do with an infrastructure is we take all this collection of IP from our engineers and kind of package it in various offerings that we can offer to partners like Amazon, right? So the Graviton servers are all ARM-based. Uh, Ampere is another strong partner of ours who produces servers you can buy. They also fed servers into Microsoft Azure, Oracle Cloud, um, and Google. Uh, we have partner. We have deployments in China as well, Alibaba, ByteDance, and some others. So um, that's what we do in the Infra Lab. That's what the Lab is short for line of business. What my team does specifically is an engineering team. We're so we're in the line of business, but we're an engineering team. About twenty of us or so, and we're kind of like solution ninjas, performance ninjas, we're, we're kind of tasked at working with partners, working with open source, working with any, any, any engineering software stack to enable it and improve the performance on ARM, right? Um, in, the, in what we call the segment, the 5G uh, infrastructure space. So we have 5G, RAN, radio access network, you'll see edge computing, which is really no different than cloud computing, it's just smaller form factor further away, in my opinion. Um, enterprise networking and storage. And we focus on a huge amount of uh, 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 the entire solution stack that we call it, right? So solutions, as you see here, what we call a solution would be a combination of the, the reference hardware, the base core components like OS, tool chain and such, and then um, specific applications on top. And I'm gonna get into that in a few more slides. Um, and again, the idea is to just improve the experience of software running on ARM, right? So Amazon, AWS is a really good partner. I talk to them more than I'd probably like to. Um, and they will say, hey, we have a customer and they're running into a problem. My SQL really isn't running as well as it should on ARM and we're trying to migrate them over to Graviton because it's good for us, it's good for them. Can you help us out? Now, you know, obviously Amazon has a huge amount of OSS engineers themselves, but they don't all necessarily have so much, so much training on ARM like we do. So we'll investigate, dive in, and you know, either sometimes it's a really quick fix, it's just a configuration thing. Uh, other times we notice it's a code problem. If my engineers can't fix it really quickly, then we'll pass it on to our open source internal team who does a lot of work upstream. They partner with all the groups. There's a laser pointer in here. Okay, is this that dot right there? Oh, look at that. Sweet. Okay, um, uh, and and that, and so and so it's a lot of random re responses to customer problems, right? So um, that's like half the team, and we'll do plenaries, we'll do web webinars, we'll do blog posts um, on the work that we do. So it's it's kind of fun. I mean, in the sense you never you know it's always different stuff every day, every week. Um, it's a little taxing as well because again we work with all the partners, right? We work with Google right now, and when they're trying to, you know, see increase the performance of Google Kubernetes engine on on the cloud, we even work with Microsoft uh, on Windows, uh, which is a little weird for me, but it's cool. Um, uh, improving their tool chain uh, and the performance of Windows on ARM uh, because Azure, as you may or may not know, runs on Windows hypervisor. And so when they threw ARM machines in there, they had to do some, some performance optimizations there. Um, so that's on what we would call, I would we say, like in terms of our customer journey, we talk about in terms of, you know, we talk about um, collaborating on a roadmap with our customers, helping them select uh, the intellectual property that they want to build their, their SOC around, their system on chip. And then they, they tape out, which means they actually produce these, these chips. And then we do a thing called uh, bring up where we help them bring up these, their server, their platform. If they run into any problems, our engineering teams are there to help. And then we try to ramp consumption of this, the, of this IP. Um, so that's on the ramp side in terms of things that are already out in the field. But we also have a pretty cool job of working to improve future IP, future chipsets, future interconnect technology and everything else that we produce. So what people probably don't know, or maybe they know, um, uh, this is a really convoluted chart, so let me explain it. Um, 
we do a lot of deep dive analysis on workloads and applications based on what we get from customers in terms of like key priority workloads that they're looking at. Customers being a lot of the cloud providers, some networking partners and storage vendors. Uh, we've done work on Ceph, we've done work on Postgres, MySQL, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Memcached, um, Nginx, I can, I can go on forever. But um, a lot of times when we're working with customers, uh, let me see here, let me go like this. Okay, so what does this mean? This N, N plus one, N plus two, blah, blah, blah. So you could think of these as when hard, hardware takes a while to get out, by the way, it's not like software. So <laughs> um, when you see N minus one, these are, N is like the, the, the current, current release of Neo versus our brand, so we just call it N. Um, you could think of this as like Graviton, for no, if you're familiar with AWS and Graviton, Graviton, Three, which is out now. If uh, there was work on Graviton 4, it'd be here, and this would be Graviton 5, if, you know. I, I can't confirm or deny this stuff. But um, this is the work I talked about uh, that we do there, where it's already out in the field. We're just doing some tuning analysis on features. Um, a lot of times, if we discover problems that we want to feed back into the cycle of IP engineering, we can kind of feed them that because, hey, there's some, there's some things you may want to change. We're seeing some, some, some odd behaviors with some performance on some workloads. Um, but the hardest thing that our partners have to do is they try to predict the future because the conversations we're having now with partners on how they select their IP to build their, their, their processors, they won't actually see that in the field for years. So there's a lot of modeling, a lot of reduction of applications down to key instructions, key assembly that we can actually probe and analyze running on, on various simulators, emulators, models, and so forth to give them some level of confidence around how this chip is gonna perform. Now, when we were just client-based on phones and small devices, it was a little easier, single core um, architecture, a lot easier to do these traces, but now we're in the cloud. Now you're looking at multi-core servers with advanced interconnects that we're trying to basically model the performance of these, these workloads. So we have a whole team of engineers who will take these key critical workloads that our partners have told us, like, we got to get these running well on ARM and try to do as much analysis as we can, working with our internal engineering teams to give them some confidence on when they're selecting their new IP as they want to do the next generation of, of their processors. So, um, that's generally what my team does on a daily basis. And um, if you've been following ARM, you know, in terms of the process of the ARM server, it's been an insane ride in the last couple of years. So we're very, very busy. Um, I, I know some people are looking for work, I've, I've heard. So we're hiring, so come find me on that too. Um, so last but not least, Ubuntu and me. Um, yeah, I've been since uh, member since 2008. That was my join date for Canonical, October 10th, I mean, October 2nd, 2008, when I left IBM. Um, it was the Intrepid release was coming up. My first UDS was, what's after I, J, J, J John T, Jackalope or whatever. Um, um, Intrepid Ibex was my release. Uh, we, I think we did our UDS at Google. I can't remember, it was a long time ago. Uh, it was Google, right? Yeah, thanks, Ogre. Um, you know, there's, there's me right there, way in the back, that tall black dude right there. Um, you can tell by the logo, this is an older release. This is how you can, <laughs> um, this was the last UDS, I think. This was Copenhagen, I believe, right? Yep, there's me again, kind of hiding over there. We had to wear these awesome shirts if you were a track lead. I don't know if any of you remember that, so, uh, five shirts <laughs> she had to wear them back. Um, and um, yeah, I still, I'm still an Ubuntu member. I don't really maintain the, my, my profile on Ubuntu Wiki, but I get that email every, every is it year, six months, a year, I guess? Yeah, I just got it this week to renew my Ubuntu membership. I always click, I still have Launchpad. Um, and uh, I still run Ubuntu, like I run it, you know, ARM has a flavor of Ubuntu, we call it, it's, it's typical straight Ubuntu, we overlay some security things on top of it, you know, VPNs and some such, but if you join ARM, you have that option of selecting Ubuntu as your OS outside of the traditional Windows and or Mac if you want a uh, 
the MacBook. Um, so that's me. And if you want to talk about that, we can, but that's an old picture as well. No Hulk picture? No, I'm not doing that. I mean, I, look, if you want to see the Hulk picture, just come and find me. I got them on my phone, but I just, I'm trying to let that go. I mean, it's been a while. I mean, granted, I have a tattoo of the Hulk on my body at some place, and we can talk about that as well, but yeah, I'll never live that down, which is fine. You know, it's, you know, it's cool. I'm, I'm down with Marvel. Um, so Junior Ubuntu and ARM, right. So I don't know how many people understand like how important Ubuntu has been in terms of the success of ARM in Linux and in, in the server space particularly, right? Um, it all started with this, with mobile and not phone, but like the mobile team, Ogre remembers. Um, Matt Zimmerman, our, our CTO at the time, sent an email out and said, hey, we're interested in, we're gonna be starting these new embedded and mobile on, on Ubuntu. Ironically, it was on Intel first because that was an Intel thought they could get back in the, to the small size from a, from a phone perspective. Um, and the mobile team was established. This is this wiki page is still up. Um, um, this email I just I found like I mean all this stuff was like I found this week. It's pretty it's pretty crazy. Um, and I think the first release of mobile was 7.10, and then I think the first ARM enablement was 9.10. Okay, yeah. Um, and yeah, so that started right and. Then around, uh, there was a pivot. <laughs> this is there too, right? This page is obsolete. The mobile team is now renamed every task to Ubuntu and ARM team. <laughs> um, and there was a hard pivot. Like, no, to be clear, this is not really, I mean, obviously Ubuntu runs on a ton of ARM devices, right? There was a lot of embedded work, a lot of work around, obviously, the Raspberry Pi, but this is particularly around server because, again, I submitted a talk for infrastructure track. Um, on the right, P, upcoming PUDS. This was a 1204, and that's when we really got serious about um, Ubuntu on ARM from a server perspective. Uh, 1110 was the actual first like beta release of this stuff, um, and it was it was it was really crazy at the time because I think this was um, 1204 UDS. I can't remember what that was, but we, we had an entire track as you can see around ARM everywhere. We were OpenStack on ARM, Juju on ARM. You know, ARM was the future, even though it wasn't even 64-bit, by the way, uh, from a standpoint of servers. But we were convinced that that would be the future back then. Um, a lot of partners uh, at the time were also we were working with to enable Ubuntu on ARM for the server space. Um, and then, let me see here. Canonical division, Ubuntu led the way. This was really cool. Um, I was going again, and some of these wikis are still here. But um, why does Canonical think Ubuntu on ARM servers will be important? And it's, you know, reading this, it's the same. These are the reasons that we, that we talk about today, right? Sustainable computing, uh, the fact that as, you know, the, the need for compute grows, you're also, there's going to be a need for uh, concern over power, um, space, and cooling where ARM succeeded. And if ARM could just get it right from a 64-bit standpoint in performance, there was a huge opportunity for ARM in the data center. Everyone laughed at the time. I mean, people thought it was hilarious. You know, the year the year the ARM server was a running joke, just like the year of uh, the Linux desktop for a while. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so then 1204, we had a release. Um, there were multiple devices, and then there was an entire ARM server page created. And from there, we would work with multiple partners at Canonical and as a Ubuntu community um, to enable various platforms, none of which are around anymore. Some companies have gone. Uh, the Thunder, Thunder X is still around, I think. Um, but they kind of ended that. And you can see 1204, 1404, 160, um, like, like, and now just today, right? Ubuntu server on ARM. Um, Without Canonical, without Ubuntu, you know, there would be no Lenaro, if you're familiar with that. Lenaro was a foundation created just to get Linux on ARM and all the insanity that was there previously together so this stuff could boot easily so you didn't have to go through, you know, uh, an entire manual of figuring out how to get your server installed with Ubuntu. Um, a lot of investment that I don't think many people recognize 
of how much the Ubuntu community and Canonical put into the ARM ecosystem on Linux. Seeding Lenaro, the, the first, the first, for, first employees of Lenaro were canonical people, right? We we had this. I had to lose people over. I was like, what? I gotta, I gotta do what? Are like, you ever gonna seed them over? They're still getting paid by canonical, but they're not gonna do work for you anymore. I was like, okay, you know. So um, there's a lot of work there. So I mean, all of this is just to say that um, Arm really thanks canonical and Ubuntu. I mean, we really thank you for the work you've done. I think that. Um, because of this work, you know, Ubuntu is led in the ARM um, server deployments. And this is what I'm going to get into now in terms of what we do um, going, going in terms of the work we do. But everything that my team does from an analysis to performance work to optimizations is done on Ubuntu. Unless specifically asked by a partner to use another Linux distro, it's Ubuntu by default. Um, and again, it's because it's always been there, it's always been reliable, and it's always worked very well on ARM, right? Launchpad has ARM builders. You know, that, I mean, that's, I don't, again, really think people appreciate the investment there. So again, ARM thanks you there. Um, so I'm gonna get into a lot of details. Again, this was supposed to be like a session, so sorry for some of this uh, application talk. But Key compute libraries optimized using Ubuntu. We have, this is a lot of what my team does, right? We, you know, we do shows, we do blogs, we do analysis, white papers. All these improvements you see here, um, again, cost savings combined with performance work, all done on Ubuntu. Um, this is pretty low level stuff. These are like core libraries. Um, again, it's, when I say my team, I mean ARM in general. There is a big group of, again, OSS engineers that do a lot of the work at the low level. Um, c contributions upstream, participation in events, uh, uh, especially when you see things like .NET, OpenJDK, we do a lot of work there. All of this again, um, done on Ubuntu. More workloads. Uh, again, we spend a lot of time deploying these things. We use Juju, believe it or not. Uh, in our lab, we use Mass uh, to deploy our, our systems. Um, uh, a lot of this is done on the cloud. A lot of this work that you see up here was done on AWS, just particularly because it was the first, uh, they were the first ones to really roll out the ARM servers at a, at a cloud level. We've done some work on Oracle Cloud as well. And then on some Ampere-based machines. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of fast because there's a lot. Um, again, more, more workloads. <laughs> uh, and then we have some up th at the bottom here is our work that we're doing right now. Um, and, and the scope of the work, these are the test cases that we'll run. This is really not relevant to you guys, but this is tests that we run. Um, some of these are pretty, up, and I mean, it's really cool to look at, like if you look at some of these SQL databases, are 30 to 40% better, faster performance on ARM, on AWS typically, again. Um, key web services, more stuff. We'll do solutions. These are mock solutions. Death Star Bench is a, <laughs> is a solutions benchmark uh, created at MIT, funded by Intel, uh, where they have representative solutions. We'll have like a social media deployment. And it's a combination of applications already pre-configured, pre-connected, that, that represent workloads that they've kind of studied. Uh, we use that as well to kind of do some testing and, and analysis. Um, IO. Uh, we do a lot of work in the 5G communication space with our partners like Nokia and Ericsson, um, where the, yes, there's a lot of on processor work, but there's also this movement towards software stacks that run, you know, Open RAN as it's called, that we do some work on. Um, we've done some work on Ceph, Rook, and, and some others. All right, uh, Android in the cloud, which you, there you're right there. We've done some work there with Anbox. That's a Pretty awesome solution, by the way, from Canonical. Um, done a lot of work with that. A lot of partners in China are, are very interested in being able to host Android in the cloud because you can, you know, with the improvements in communication technology, you can have high-end games that are streamed over to a low-end phone. Um, so I worked with Simon Fells, thanks to him and his team, a lot with this um, Anbox solution. Uh, we did a demo at a uh, game developer conference of this with Ampere. Um, we had it hosted. We still have it running in my lab, so I can always connect to a machine and play a few Android games if I want to. Um, 
But it's a, it's a, I mean, I get asked about it just this week. I mean, again, it's a really awesome solution that uh, a lot of folks, particularly in, in the China market, are interested in in terms of hosting. So hopefully Canonical can turn that into a chunk of cash. Um, uh, and then these are other random <laughs> demos we do. Smart cities, Edge. We do a lot of really cool stuff just because, you know, so many cool things run on ARM now. We can demo smart, you know, Edge analytics. We do a lot of ML, AI processing, um, improving the performance of those as well. Again, all on ARM. Okay, let me see what time, cool. Going forward, these are things that we are doing with Ubuntu uh, or would like to do with Ubuntu in terms of, you know, the journey of, again, ARM and, and, and Ubuntu as, as, as a partnership. Um, ARM on ARM initiatives. This means developing ARM on ARM. The ARM laptop, the infamous ARM laptop dream. Um, there's been some stumbles along the way, but it's getting better. The ThinkPad 13S is out, Qualcomm enabled Snapdragon. We are working with uh, Canonical, Debian, and Lenovo to have these available for you to actually have running Ubuntu on it cleanly. Are we going for a pre-install, Andy, or are they? Yep, pre-installed, so like, kind of like the Dell versions of the XPS. Um, this is a very detailed slide of where we're at in terms of enablement. This does not, so again, you know, server team, infrastructure, we don't really do a lot of the client stuff, but we're always interested in, in what the other teams are doing. This is really near and dear to my heart because, again, I run Ubuntu at ARM now. So on the Intel laptop, I would love to be able to run it on ARM. So I'm in line to get one of these pretty soon. I think Andy already has one, but he's in OSS, so he gets, gets dibs. Um, and again, we're, we're partnering now to this. So you can expect this to be pretty soon, hopefully. It's pretty exciting. The performance is actually not that bad now. Um, in the future, you can expect to see some People have discovered that you can have alternative x86 processing in laptops, and it actually runs very, very well. Um, certain fruit company has a pretty nice laptop running on alternative hardware really, really well. Um, <laughs> and then keep up the great work that you're doing already. Uh, Juju, man, let me talk about Juju. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, when, I, when I came and joined ARM and I, and I was talking to the engineering team and they were like, yeah, we run Juju. I said, wait, stop, what, wait, what? They're like, yeah, we run Juju, we write charms. I said, you write charms. Like, where the hell were you guys like five years ago when it was like <laughs> my mission to find you and like promote this stuff, right? Um, it's, it was, I don't even know who made the decision, you know, maybe they don't even work in my team anymore, but we still deploy it, we still use Juju. They also use Ansible as needed for configuration. Um, even a little Terraform, but yeah, we still have charms. It was part of the training for some of the performance engineers. They had to learn how to write charms. It was, I was blown away by that. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Um, we use mass, they love it, right? Again, I had a long battle. <laughs> what did we call Juju at first, Ensemble? Remember that? <laughs> yeah, and uh, this was called Orchestra, I mean, and then a certain man who owns the company renamed it to Metal as a Service. Um, but uh, yeah, we use these and love it. We use Mass to deploy even to Windows. It's really useful for us. Um, we're kind of having to work through Windows deployment on ARM, but that's not Mass's fault. That's the Windows on ARM is not yet ready on a server basis, but we're, we're getting there. We do that for a lot of our development. Um, all the work you guys, you know, that Canonical and Ubuntu does for the cloud is huge, right? And so keep that up, you know, having the instances there, having them performant on ARM, the testing that gets done, again, like, I can't tell you how useful that is. Like, even AWS, like, they have their own Amazon Linux, but they never ask us, hey, can you run this test on uh, Amazon Linux? No, it's normally Ubuntu because they're kind of trying to replicate whatever their customers are running, not to call them out. They do run on Amazon Linux. They do provide that to, for folks, but it's, all, it's, it's, like I said, even on Azure, Ubuntu, Oracle, Ubuntu, all these clouds, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Um, and then real-time Linux, uh, Y'all, I think, uh, just released in the last Ubuntu release, it was official, real time. Um, always been on Intel, but on, on ARM is very critical for us. I mean, mostly targeted at the auto space because you don't want to have your kernel preempted if your car is supposed to be swerving or stopping and saving your life. Um, but, uh, but from a standpoint of the infrastructure team, it's in the 5G communications, telecommunications. And so we've been working directly with um, 
Joseph, Joe, who's the con who's the real time engineer in Canonical? Anybody know? I can't. Remember. He's been there forever. Uh, he's gonna be mad at me for forgetting his name. Anyway, we're working directly patching, running performance feedback to give them, you know, to make Ubuntu the real time kernel like kick ass on ARM. And so I'm really, I'm really, really happy about that because again, we need this as we look towards implementing 5G and believe it or not, 6G solutions with some of our partners. Um, and then I have an ask here. Multi-arch support is the future again. So a long time ago, there was this spec here, multi-arch spec. If you go look at our good, my good friend Steve Langaset created it. I think Mark used to make fun of me for saying, you know, this is the release of multi-arch. He's like, yeah, good luck. Like it took a while to get this right. And it was just to be able to get 32 and 64-bit binaries combined on the same deb, like the same insta installation, some cross compilation, but it was a big step forward in terms of supporting multi-arch from a distro perspective. And then we obviously had multi-arch, uh, you know, in terms of uh, architectural CPUs. Now the challenge is that a lot of people don't use packages anymore. <laughs> and what we run into is, um, particularly around Python and Docker, uh, we'll have these solutions that we want to enable on ARM, get deployed on ARM, we'll run through their recipe, their, you know, whatever their instructions are, and they're only building Docker images on x86. And I get it, so, you know, for a long time, it's been the predominant architecture, but now, there's so many different flavors out there now. I mean, Ubuntu runs on power, runs on the mainframe, which is amazing. Um, we have AMD Intel, RISC-V is, is making a, you know, a, a huge surge, you know, Apple Silicon, all these different architectures you know, I, I'm asking anyone who's writing applications, who are developers, think from think of multi-arch. There's CI/CD services now on ARM and some of these other platforms. There's there's tooling. There's there's how-to write-ups. If you need, you know, you can go to our website. There's tooling to, to understand this. A lot of times, this should just work. You know, Go just works. Thankfully, on ARM. Again, when it comes to these pre, con, you know, pre-packaged solutions, though, NPMs, DEBs. I mean, I'm sorry, NPMs. Docker images, Python wheels, snaps. Don't assume x86. Um, if you're writing things that are highly performance, specifically if it's AI, ML applications, and you're using SIMD vectorized code, don't always just assume it's AVX 512. Right? There's Neon, there's SVE, SV2 is coming um, on the ARM side. And there's tools, there's people who can help, you can reach out. We're trying to grow our developer program so people are aware. No one calls themselves, you know, quote unquote, an ARM developer like no one calls themselves, I'm an Intel developer, right? It's just about applications, and I get it, completely get it. But it's just, a, I guess it's the, the next evolution that we need to kind of think of as you're developing your applications and your solutions. Um, I think I have a shameless plug. Yes, like I said, we are, ARM has always had developer.com. We've always been engaging with the upstreams, but we've always kind of been also behind the scenes, I think. And now we're trying to really come out in terms of embracing software, software developers, understanding that it's the software that's driving the hardware. Yes, hardware is important, it's critical, but it's no longer, and you know, when I was growing up, it was about the software keeping up with the hardware innovations and the hardware companies driving the software features. It's, it's completely upside down, right? Now it's, okay, I need, the, I need these applications, these workloads are running really well. Let's design this, this, this hardware together. Let's, you know, is it an offload, you know, accelerator? Are we doing IPU slash DPUs, you know, data processing units, which are basically this uh, smart NIC on steroids? Um, you know, are, are, we, are we designing, you know, 3D chiplets? Are we doing, you know, you know, uh, fast interconnects between the, the cores. I mean, all this is around software. So ARM is reinvigorated around really going after the community, building a community of people who develop on ARM software. So check out that website, please. We are, we are looking for help. Um, there's different membership levels. There's an ambassador level where, it's all free, by the way. Um, but if you get selected as ambassador, I guess, I mean, I, I, don't know what all the, I don't know all the perks yet. To be honest, this is kind of a new rollout. But, you know, there's some cool things that I think you get as, if you're selected as an ambassador. And I think selection really just means kind of a deep dive into your experience. And you can be, you know, Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, robots, um, 
uh, if you're in the mobile space, it doesn't matter. Like we're looking for folks to really get that feedback as we start to, you know, we still know there's a lot of work to do in the software space, and so we need that help. Um, and again, it's a shameless plug because somebody responded to a random marketing email, and they're like, hey, can you send us a picture real quick? And, and I was like, for what? Oh, just for this developer thing. So now I'm on the website, so I kind of have to own this. So apparently I'm an ARM expert on this developer website. I don't know if I could say that, but um, again, we're really looking for that help, that, 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 that input. We have a Discord server. We're all fancy now. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then you got yeah, and then you have Robert Wolf. If, if some of you may or may not know him, he has like, like a YouTube channel on this stuff. We launched Dev Summit online. We're looking to have like more of those in person. But again, we're, we're still trying to really represent, like, replicate what Canonical and, and Ubuntu have done, right? To have passionate people, you know, pushing us forward because we can't do it ourselves. Um, and with that, I'm done. Really, I mean, I we got about 15 minutes. I can take questions about mostly anything, some legal things I can't talk about, but I can hint to. Any questions? Or just find me later, it's no big deal. <laughs> I love these Elmo check, boxes. Check. I love the Elmo boxes. Don't ask me about Qualcomm. What? <laughs> No? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So you said that when you join ARM, you can run Ubuntu. On what? I run Ubuntu on my ThinkPad uh, Yoga. I have it in my bag. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, <laughs>
So basically, I'm trying to look into, when you're looking into an instruction set for, uh, aspect, how do you go in, around like in that, in that level, and, and how does it differ from the application uh, programmer developer, basically? Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, performance analysis, are, there's like multi-layered cake of what we do for performance, right? Sometimes, again, it's really easy. It's just a configuration change for the given workload. Um, uh, and again, sometimes it's a code change. Um, in terms of how we measure the performance, it's a lot of around latency and throughput a lot of times when it's data, you know, from, from a data standpoint. You know, most people just want their stuff to be fast, right? <laughs> um, um, we do get away with sometimes a performance per dollar thing that we can do as well because of the pricing that happens with some of the ARM servers services. Um, so maybe, you know, it may not, be, it, it could be maybe a little underperforming on x86, but you're saving so much that you can, de you can deploy more instances and, and make that up. Um, in terms of instruction sets and how we look at that, uh, that, yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's, like you said, we're, you know, memory, memory allocation, storage. Uh, we do a lot of vectorization analysis, uh, how to speed up that. There's a lot of work around understanding what happens on multi-core systems in terms of where the hotspots are. I mean, I, I, you may need to find me after. There's a lot. I mean, because, and, and it's not even on CPU performance. Sometimes it's between cores you know, in terms of interconnects. And then obviously what we run into, specifically in the cloud, is that there's all the other layers of inception between the piece, the, 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 the CPU underneath. And, you know, for example, Amazon has this thing called Nitro, which is kind of like it's, you know, uh, hypervisor, but at like a machine level. And then there's storage and networking performance and everything else. But um, yeah, we have an entire organization that does that. We, we take also traces from our partners where they literally go to like, this is purely an example, but say, you know, you can go to like uh, a service running in Azure, for example, and they almost literally hit record, record how that's running on the system. They, we, we validate it and they want to give it back to us so then we can replay it and figure out, again, bottlenecks, performance issues. So it's a lot of work actually to, to <laughs> The architecture, how much it goes back to the architecture? Um, a lot. I mean, we're, we're, to be fair, ARM is still playing catch up in a lot of ways in the server space, right? A lot of what we hear is, hey, you know, this is what we can do on x86. How do we do that on ARM? And you got to figure it out because, you know, there's a lot of different ways. But now we're actually starting to look forward in terms of security, uh, cryptography, performance. Um, and a lot of it goes back, a lot. I mean, because we're learning as well. We're growing up in the space. A lot of our Central technology, our engineers, they grew up in a client space and there's a lot of things that they're just discovering from the, from the, from the workloads that we're getting now, um, a, a, new, a new ways to speed up things. We have different combinations of chipsets, you know, a big little where you have a big cores running certain things, a little offloading. I mean, there's a lot of different things we're doing now in the processor space because, you know, we're running up against more. It's law. We can't get smaller. So now you're getting different weird combinations of chipsets and interconnects to, to meet the demands of compute. Um, I have a question. You had a slide on the multi-arch, and you talked about a situation where there's a packaging system which describes or models your architecture, and then people are basically using Docker containers and other things that are higher-level concepts that break um, because, you know, as, uh, x86, 64 is assumed, and so forth. And I notice this a lot in where I work as well, and I see that software engineers don't really understand packaging, and they, they kind of tend to reinvent the wheel or wanted to build things that are more complex on top. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, if, if you have an opinion as to why that is and why, generally speaking, packaging is such an obscure thing and we don't use it more often. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, I don't know. Right? I mean, anyone ever done a Debian package? That shit's hard. I did it. I mean, but I mean, I, 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 like, the, I like the benefits of it of packages, I think, but, but the fact of the matter is things are moving so fast. We've created this culture of, I want it now, deploy it there. Doesn't matter where it's coming from, just Docker deploy. Where'd you get that NPM from? Mm -hmm. Works, works for me, right? I don't care about security issues, you know, unless, until it goes into production. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, you know I, had, I used to have web developers who work for me too, so I understand all that. And it's great in terms of being able to have what you want now, the latest and greatest. I mean, that's how Ubuntu got started, right? Because remember, we were revolutionary 
as a Ubuntu distro back when Red Hat was telling you, no, you can't get new stuff every 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 few months. It has to be every few years, right? So it's just it's an evolution of that. Um, but what it's created is this supply chain security issue of you know you don't necessarily know where you're getting these packages from. You don't necessarily know what's going down with them, and it's hard for a distro that you know that Mark kind of talked about yesterday in terms of that. That, that balance of allowing people to do what they want, but also providing that trust and security, and it, they, they work against each other. Um, and again, for us, you know, there's been some movement because of other architectures supporting non-x86, open source, you know, projects that we went to in the past where we said, hey, you know, we ported this for you, you know, will you support on? They're like, no, it's too much heavy uplift from a CIC per CICD perspective and so forth. Now they're starting to do that, but again, there's still a heavy amount of, at least in the cloud native deployments. Oh yeah, just do Docker installs. Like, but do you have ARM Docker images? Like, no. But that's that's getting better too. But yeah, as to why people don't do packaging, it's just because it's hard. I don't know. <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, but it's but it's worth doing. I would love to have more packages and less random things outside of snaps. Snaps are cool, but I I don't run them too much on my server. Um, but yeah, that's my opinion on that one. like to um, make our software more energy efficient because we need to lower the total carbon footprint of using it. But we have a debate within Canonical. Some people fear that if we do that or when we do that, people will just use more of it and more instances because it'll be cheaper. So we won't actually succeed in our aim of lowering the total carbon footprint at all. Have you had those kinds of debates within ARM about energy efficiency, and have you any thoughts on that debate? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, yeah, I definitely see your point. I mean, if, and if you didn't hear, I mean, you know, when, when, it's, when you can get more of it, human nature is that, is that you will, basically, is what you're saying, <laughs> right? Um, I don't think, I mean, I, we've never had that philosophical debate, at least that I'm aware of with an arm, but I think, I think that's always a, something to be concerned about, like you said, you know, but I, th I think there's some constraints there that keep that from happening at large scale, particularly around power, space, and cooling, right? They're limited on power. If you're limited on the space, you're limited on what you can do from a cooling perspective, it's, it, you're really looking just to fit more compute in a smaller space. So, I mean, I think just physical limitations of some of the things that are happening, I don't, I'm not sure it's a, you know, a, a concern in that way. I mean, sustainable computing is huge, you know, it's huge for us. Um, uh, and, and, we, and power efficiency, you know, that, that's a huge, that's one of the things that we always measure our, our, our offerings on and, and that we get asked about. Um, and now if you think about it, like proliferation, if you think about, you know, edge computing, 5G, the, the necessary for more compute closer to the end. If you're into gaming, which both of my kids are, you want to be able to have that offload closer so you have less lag, so I don't have to hear them screaming because they can't get their kill shot off or whatever. Um, I, think, I think more of a concern is just the proliferation of, like, the need for more computing closer to the user. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting philosophical question, I guess. You know, within Canonical, if you're debating whether or not you want to make your, your, I don't know how it could be a bad thing to be more efficient, to be honest with you. I mean, yes, you can go to the extensional thing of, well, then more, more people will use it. Sure, but if you didn't make it efficient, they're still going to use it, right? <laughs> like, there's still the need. That's the thing, unfortunately. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting concept, though. I, I mean, I, typical Canonical debate. <laughs> okay, folks. Couple more questions before we move on. We only have two more minutes left. Hello. Ah, okay. Um, so I was missing one one thing on your on your optimization tables here. Uh, when I buy such a laptop, um, I at times have to run one of these obsolete ar architectures on it, and I haven't seen anything about KVM or QEMU. So I could run x86, for example, on my ARM laptop. Ooh. Have you done any optimization work on that side? <laughs> Andy's thinking. You can. 
Yeah. Fine, Andy. I know, I know talk I can. How, I mean, how, yeah, how performant will it, will it be? Yeah, yeah we're, I mean, I can't, I mean, like, again, I don't work a lot on the client side, but I know you can. I just know, I don't know, I'm from a performance perspective, I don't know how much, yeah, it's still in development. Contributions are, yeah. Thanks. Um, I believe in the next few years, you'll see extremely performant ARM-based laptops that you can install Ubuntu on, that Windows will work on flawlessly. I firmly know that. I, I, you know, that's just my personal belief. I'm not leaking out any confidential things, by the way. But yeah. <laughs> One more? Go ahead. Uh, so, quick question. Um, is there a wish or a target to try to have kind of universal binaries um, as a way to solve the packaging problem for Windows or Linux? Man. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I would love a universal binary that works across our architectures. I don't know how, if you could do that, man, that would put you all on the map. But I don't know, that's, that's a hard ask. I mean, unless you want to over, how would you do that? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that would be great, but you know, I'm not, you know, I'm just happy to have, again, the binaries aren't a problem, to be honest. I mean, I mean, especially for Ubuntu, you have builders. Launchpad will build these things for you. It's pretty amazing from a packaging standpoint. I'm very thankful for that. Um, it's just when you're doing the prepackaged solutions, just build the Docker image. It's all good. Yes, yes. Snaps are right, right. Yeah, four gig snap. Right. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank so you. Thank you. That is what we have time for now. Thanks, Robbie.